Well, welcome to our excursion called Learn the Bible in 24 Hours. It's uh, one of the most exciting adventures I've ever had, and we certainly hope it will be for you too. And whenever we take on something like this, of course, the first thing we should do is take it to prayer. So let's bow our hearts for a word of prayer. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we come before you this day in awe and thanksgiving for the opportunity to discover the extremes that you have gone to on our behalf. We acknowledge our need to learn the real truth about you, the real truth about your creation, and the real truth about ourselves. We seek and solicit your Holy Spirit to open your word to us and to open us to your word and to guide us as we explore this adventure between the miracle of our origin and the mystery of our destiny. May your will be accomplished in each of us as we listen to these words and seek your eternal truth, as we commit ourselves into your hands, in the name of Yeshua, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. You know, they say no person's education is complete if they do not know their Bible. And this essential completeness has been outlawed in our government schools. Many of our children are actually in enforced paganism, so it's a real challenge before us. And one of the things we need to do is repair our own illiteracy about the Bible and to assist those around us to really understand how far God has gone on our behalf. You know, George Washington said, it is impossible to rightly govern the world without God and the Bible. The veneration of the Word of God characterized the earlier leadership, which established our precious heritage. Abe Lincoln also said, I believe the Bible is the best gift God has ever given to man. All the good from the Savior of the world is communicated to us through this book. You know, it's sobering to really acknowledge the preciousness of our heritage that has come to us at such a high price, and yet how tragically we have fallen. Patrick Henry said, the Bible is worth all the other books which have ever been printed. And for the past 2,000 years, it is a treasure that millions willingly died for. And yet we all tend to take this for granted. Even Napoleon said, the Bible is no mere book, but it is a living creature with a power that conquers all that oppose it. See, even secular leaders have acknowledged its uniqueness. In fact, Napoleon was technically correct if you look at Hebrews 4.12. It is alive and powerful. You know, there's another quote that is so often misquoted. Many of us heard the phrase, Jack of all trades, master of none. That's attributed to Ben Franklin, but it's actually a misquote. That's not what he said. He actually said, Jack of all trades, master of one. His whole concept of education was that a cultured person is one who knows something about everything and everything about something. And for a Christian, of course, his specialization has to be the Word of God, the Bible itself. And your presence here in this project is a key step in correcting our biblically illiterate times. Daniel Webster said, if we abide by the principles taught in the Bible, our country will go on prospering and to prosper. But if we and our posterity neglect its instructions and authority, no man can tell how sudden a catastrophe may overwhelm us and bury all our glory in profound obscurity. We are on a treacherous precipice, more treacherous than we can possibly imagine. You know, we do have authority crisis. Take your pick, whether it's parental authority, marital authority, political authority, academic authority, or ecclesiastical authority. Do your own analysis and assessment. You know, if we look at the leading cultural indicators of the past 30 years, population has increased 41%, gross domestic product has increased by 300%, social spending has increased by 500%. And yet... There's been a 560% increase in violent crime, 400% increase in illegitimate births, 400% increase in the divorce rate, a 300% increase in single-parent homes, a 200% increase in teenage suicides, and a 75% drop in SAT scores. 
Why? What happened? Since 1963, the divorce rates, the breakup of family units, the acceptance of homosexuality, the teenage pregnancies, the murder of inconvenient babies, and crime rates have all escalated off the charts. What happened in 1963? Up till then, these things were improving pretty much, but from that point on, they've all taken a uh, sharp uh, move to catastrophe. In 1963, we outlawed the Bible from our schools. Well, what's ahead? What's in front of us in this project is what I call the ultimate literary adventure. And we hope that this brief excursion will result in a practical grasp of the entire Bible, a perspective from which you will be able to navigate your personal adventure through the rest of your lifetime and more. It is the greatest drama of all time. We're going to reach far beyond the Earth's prehistory, behind the myths of legend and folklore, to discover the greatest drama of all time and of all literature. We're going to encounter the greatest evils, betrayals, revenge, deceptions, and the ultimate prince of darkness. We'll also encounter the greatest good, the highest achievements, the noblest courage, the most demanding sacrifices, in fact, the ultimate sacrifice, the kinsman redeemer of all mankind. We're going to find ourselves in the greatest romance, a courtship between a sovereign God and his rebellious offspring. We will also explore the ultimate ironies of all literature with hidden surprises on every page. We will experience the rise of great empires as well as their fall through dreams, visions, and secret encrypted messages Great leaders will discover letters written to them personally from extraterrestrial sources, outlining their careers and achievements in advance, and giving them instructions as to how to proceed. We will thrill to heroes seizing victories against impossible odds, betrayals of thrones and retributions and vendettas and conspiracies tumbling proud empires. We will probe the greatest mysteries ever to confront mankind, the nature of time, the paradox of predestination and free will the purity of God and the frustrations of man in the search for good amidst the reign of evil, and the nature of evil. Where did it come from and why? We will discover this ancient record anticipates the very latest scientific discoveries of particle physics, cosmology, of hyperspaces and time travel, the discovery that we are dwelling within a virtual reality that is transcended by a larger one into which both benevolent and malevolent superbeings intervene from other dimensions. And we will stagger in awe of the biography of an actual Superman, his origin, his mission, and his manifest destiny, his understated powers, his betrayal, which was even under his own control, by which he was to accomplish his mission impossible. The creator himself entering his creation to repair the damage introduced by a dark intruder who had previously ruled the planet Earth. We'll discover that we are, in fact, in a cosmic war. We will discover that we are, in fact, in possession of an integrated series of messages from an extraterrestrial source that describe the origin, the career, and the destiny of super beings, which are behind the scenes of our physical universe, a universe which scientists now discover is actually a digital simulation contained within a much larger reality. The field of particle physics has totally altered our conceptions of reality. Scientists now tell us that our universe consists of at least 10 dimensions. There are some investigators who believe that much of what we call paranormal phenomena are simply dimensional episodes intruding from a larger reality. We also now discover that we are actually engaged in a cosmic warfare, a hyperdimensional conflict between good and evil that will come to a climax on our near horizon. We are the hostages of a prince of darkness that makes Darth Vader look like a Boy Scout. And we find that each of us are both the pawns and the prize in this cosmic warfare. Yet this isn't fictional entertainment. It will be the determinant of our own personal destinies. This is our ultimate adventure. It's the ultimate love story written in blood on a wooden cross that was erected in Judea some 2,000 years ago. We're going to undertake the ultimate adventure involving each of us in this interval between the miracle of our origin and the mystery of our destiny. If this series is successful, it should ignite a passion, perhaps even an obsession, 
that will inflame a lifetime of adventure, excitement, insight, and satisfaction not available through any other pursuit. This excursion is intended to be an enticement and a broad background against which to undertake detailed studies with a verse-by-verse -verse commentary of each book in a lifetime hobby that is the gateway to eternity. We've presumed to take on this ambitious project because of our unique advantage. That's based on two discoveries. We have 66 books that we call the Bible, and even though they're penned by over 40 different people who didn't even know each other, over a period of virtually 2,000 years, the great discovery is that these 66 separate books, although penned by over 40 different individuals over several thousand years, we discover are an intricate, skillfully designed, integrated message system. And I don't simply mean that the theme of the Old Testament is fulfilled in the New, no much more than that. We discover every number, every place name, every detail in the text is there by deliberate design. And once you discover that for yourself, that leads you to the second discovery, and that is that this design you can prove had to have its origin from outside our space-time, that is outside our time domain. You say you can't prove the Bible. Yes, you can when you discover it's the, the integrity of its design and then recognize that it had to have its origin from outside the dimensionality of time altogether. One integrated design. The New Testament is in the Old Testament concealed, and the Old Testament is in the New Testament revealed. Now, a few caveats before we go on. We do, we do have to recognize that the Word of God is inexhaustible. You can't learn everything about it in 24 hours. 24 years would be insufficient. But we do hope you can gain a navigational, strategic view of it all. And the truth is in the details. The difficulty of a survey like this is we need to have a grasp of the details to understand the integrity of that design. Every detail in the Scripture, every place name, is connected with every other. Our goal is a strategic grasp of the entire design. We hope that you will gain a conceptual grounding in the major truths, but also have a navigational awareness so you can fit it all together. And uh, now, we have some advantages that were not available in the past. Many of the skeptical theories that pervade our culture have been disproven. The historicity of the patriarchal accounts is now well established. People have denied there was writing in Moses' day. That's nonsense. We have substantial evidence of it being established much earlier. The Gospels and the Epistles have been dated to the second century. Nonsense. The recent discoveries have made them contemporaneous with the apostles. Much to be uh, learned by the refutations that come from archaeological discoveries, recent documentary discoveries, and competent analysis of that which we have. So the facts and the science and the evidence is on our side. Some preliminaries. First, one of the things we always have to do in our taking a, a study like this is to blindfold our prejudices. We somehow need to shed the baggage of our preconceptions and our misconceptions that we can be bringing to the table here. The only sure barrier to truth is the presumption you already have it. So we want to set aside the myths and legends that have misled us and uh, go at this with a fresh look. 20th century science has vindicated the biblical perspectives of reality. The more you know about the frontiers of science, the more comfortable the creation account in Genesis reads. And we'll show you some of that. See, we know today that we live in a finite universe. That's the great discovery of 20th century science, is that we, the universe is finite. We also are indebted to Dr. Einstein and other discoveries in discovering that time is a physical property. The discovery of the nature of time is an essential foundation to really understand much of the biblical truth. And the realization of hyperspaces, that there are spaces of more than three dimensions we directly experience. That's been proven in the laboratory and is fundamental to really understanding much of what the Bible has to say. We have finite boundaries. We know that the universe had a beginning. That's what leads scientists to speculate with the so-called Big Bang models and so forth. Scientists also know that it's all winding down. Ultimately, our thermodynamic universe will eventually wind down, and they, have, they speak of what they call a heat death. So they see the universe having started at the singularity they call the Big Bang, and it goes to an ultimate wind down. We are in a finite universe with a, within, a finite spirit, uh, within a finite span of time. I want to talk a little bit, before we get into the actual study, 
some background things about the nature of reality. And I wanted to give you a quick glimpse of what we call in mathematics a hyperspace. Let's go back and recall what we may have learned in high school or college in trigonometry. You may recall that we had a triangle that had uh, you know, three angles. If we added up the angles of a triangle, it added up to what? 180 degrees. No matter what triangle we took, it was always the angles would add up to 180 degrees. Well, suppose we were confronted with a triangle in which the angles add up to more than 180 degrees. If we go out into a large field and lay out a very large triangle, and we bring in the figures and we add up the angles that we measured and we discover they add up to more than 180 degrees, your first reaction might be that, gee, we've made a mistake. No, we simply have encountered the curvature of the Earth. This little rule that we all learned, that angles of a triangle add up to 180 degrees, is only true for a universe of two dimensions. And when you find a rule like that being violated, it's a hint that we may have encountered an additional dimension. If you take a course in navigation, part of that course will include some elements of spherical trigonometry in which you can have 90 degrees in each of the angles. In fact, you can also, if you encounter a triangle that has less than 180 degrees, you've encountered a hyperbolic paraboloid. Now, most of us aren't going to be concerned with that, but the point is these little rules are true of a universe of only two dimensions. That's why they call it plane trigonometry or plane geometry. Well, it was those kinds of insights that gave Dr. Einstein his insight when he was gr uh, grappling with the nature of space. The special theory of 1905 um, dealt with the relativity of mass, velocity, and time relative to the velocity of an observer. That's the special theory of relativity. But that led 10 years later to his general theory, the general theory of relativity by Dr. Einstein. And we won't get into the math, of course, but it's important for each of us to understand the significance of that discovery was that we live in more than three dimensions. He realized there's no distinction between time and space, that we don't live in three dimensions, we live in at least four. One of those is time. And that's, we call it the theory of relativity, but it's been confirmed over 14 different ways to 19 decimal places. So for practical purposes, it's, it's well established. But we need to understand the nature of time because it will undergird so much of what we're going to encounter as we get into our Bible studies. Let me give you another example. There are atomic clocks that are accurate to better than one second in a million years. There's one of these located at the National Institute of Standards and Technology at Boulder, Colorado. There's an identical clock, virtually identical clock, at the Royal Observatory at Greenwich, England. Both these are very elaborate scientific devices that are incredibly accurate. They're accurate to better than one second per million years. And uh, this... Uh, uh, I'm always reminded whenever I encounter this, when I was on the board of a company that was acquiring a, a company that made cesium clocks in Boston, um, when we were in this acquisition, the proud president was presenting to our board the, uh, um, the fact that they made these clocks that are this accurate. And I, I said, I only have two questions as a, an acquiring director. Uh, how do you know? <laughs> and who cares? Well, the way you know is from the resonance of the cesium atom, and I won't go into that all here, but it's who cares? The accuracy, of your ability to, the, the accuracy of your measurement of time determines the accuracy of your navigation. And these clocks, this kind of clock, makes the uh, global positioning satellite system possible. But the point is, these two uh, super clocks in uh, Boulder, Colorado, and at Greenwich, England, uh, are differing every year by five microseconds. The one at Boulder is five microseconds a year faster than the identical clock at Greenwich. The question is, which one is correct? And the answer is, they both are. The clocks are not inaccurate. Time is different. You see, in Boulder, Colorado, is at 5,400 feet altitude above sea level. In Greenwich, England, it's 80 foot above sea level. And time is actually different at those two uh, places because of a difference in gravity, among other things. These atomic clocks, if I had an atomic clock here on the platform and raised it one meter, it would speed up by one part in 10 to the 16th. In other words, 10 with 16 zeros after it. Not much, not enough to change your schedule, but it's predictable and it is measurable. And they actually did this. They sent aircraft around the world, eastward, with a, such a clock and one at rest at the observatory. They also sent one around the world westward. And they gained and lost exactly what Einstein's theory would have predicted due to the relative motions and so forth. But another example that perhaps will get this across, if you read a physics textbook in this area, you'll, they almost always talk about two hypothetical astronauts. And uh, we're going to leave one right here, and we're going to send the other one to the nearest star. If you go out to the night sky, 
there is a star called Alpha Centauri. It's four and a half light years away, light years of measurement of distance. And we're going to send one of these imaginary astronauts to Alpha Centauri and back. Well, Alpha Centauri is four and a half light years away. So if we send him there at half the speed of light, it'll take nine years to get there and nine years to come back. It's an 18-year deal. That's on, that's on Earth time. If he takes a clock with him, he'll discover something strange. On his clock, his clock, because of the uh, uh, travel and so forth, will speed at a different uh, at rate. And since he's traveling at... Uh, uh, 50% of the speed of light, you can apply the Lorentz transformations to make that correction, and you'll discover that when he gets back, he will end up being two years, five months younger than his twin brother. Here are two astronauts born at the same instant. One goes on this trip, and when he gets back, he'll be more than two years younger than his twin brother. And if that doesn't bother you, you weren't listening carefully. This is an example of what we call the dilation of time. Time is a physical property. It varies just as length, mass, and other things vary uh, due to Einstein's theory of relativity. And so let's to dramatize this further. Suppose we could send him, assume we could send him at almost the speed of light, say 99.99% speed of light. Four and a half light year trip, round trip would be nine years. On our clock, on his clock, it would be 33 days. So that gives you a feeling for, uh, it should help you understand that time is not an absolute, it's variable. It's, a, it's not uniform. Time is a physical property. It varies with mass, acceleration, and gravity, among other things. And this is an insight that is profoundly useful as we approach some of the subjects we're going to talk about in this study. You and I, we now know, exist in more than three. In fact, more, it, it, the experts tell us we live in ten dimensions, more than three. See, all of us think of time as being linear. When we were in school, the teacher went to the blackboard and wrote a line, starting at the left and going over to the right. And uh, the beginning, the left end of the line was the birth of the famous person, the founding of an empire, what have you. And the right end of that line would be the death of that person or the fall of that empire. All of us have made timelines in school. Well, because of that background, it's natural for us when we encounter the concept of eternity, we tend to jump to the conclusion that it's sort of like a line that starts at infinity on the left and goes to infinity on the right. In other words, we think of eternity as, ha as having lots of time. Well, that's good poetry. It makes a nice verse in Amazing Grace, the fourth verse and what have you. But it's uh, bad physics. Because let me ask you a question. Is God subject to the restrictions of mass or acceleration or gravity? Hardly. He is not simply somebody with lots of time, as we tend to imagine eternity, but he's rather, he is outside dimensionality of time altogether. And that is his uniqueness, and he uses that to authenticate his messages to you. That's what Isaiah means when he says, thus saith the high and lofty one that inhabiteth eternity. Since God has the technology to create us, he certainly has the technology to get a message to us. The challenge is, how does he authenticate his message? How does he let us know that the message is really from him and not some kind of contrivance or a fraud of some kind? Well, one of the ways he authenticates it, there's several ways. One of the ways, he declares the end from the beginning and from ancient times the things that are not yet done. In other words, he writes history before it happens. We call that prophecy. Many people ask me, Chuck, what do you, what's your profession? I say, I'm a history teacher. I, treat, I teach history in advance. And, of course, I'm being a, a, only a little bit facetious there. The geometry of eternity, if I take this line that we have on the screen here, and if I bring it out to you in three dimensions, imagine this curved line is coming out at you from the screen. It's a line. And we are at a point in this line that we'll call the present. Behind us is the past. Ahead of us is the future. For us, life is a sequence of events. And uh, we can move forward and... Uh, uh, look back. We can't look forward or move back, but that's a whole other discussion for another time. It, for someone who is outside the dimension of that linear length of time, say in eternity, that person that's outside that line can see the past, the present, and the future simultaneously. Let me give you an analogy. Suppose you're watching a parade, the Rose Parade, the first of the year or whatever you, your hometown might have. For you, as you're sitting on the curb, around the corner comes the marching units, the bands, the floats, the whatevers, are, 
For you, the parade is a sequence. They come around the corner, they go by you, and they go around the next corner. So you, that's like life is. It's a sequence. But for someone who is not in the plane of that parade's existence, say, in a helicopter above the parade, they can see the staging area where all the floats are get, getting prepared, ready to start. They can see the whole parade route, and they can also see the other end where they disband. They can see the beginning and the end simultaneously. A clumsy analogy, but it gets the idea across, I think. My favorite quote from Dr. Einstein is, people like us who believe in physics know that the distinction between the past, the present, and the future is only a stubbornly persistent illusion. And indeed it is. So the point I want to get across with all this is important for you to really understand that the, the nature of time, it's a physical dimension, and it varies with mass, acceleration, and gravity. There's a footnote I'd like to add here a little bit about some architecture. I'm obviously using a computer here that consists of microcircuits and a memory and all kinds of hardwire, wires and resistors and all kinds of, uh, of electronic parts. And um, it also, inside the computer, is software. There's an operating system. There's uh, all kinds of, of, of uh, languages and messages going around and so forth. If you knew everything there is to know about every piece of hardware in this computer, could you predict its behavior? And the answer, of course not. It's, just, it's simply an environment within which the software operates. Its behavior, how it responds to things, is, due, is a function of the software that's in it. Now, let's talk a little bit about software. You see, the physical equipment is equivalent to like our, our physical bodies, our flesh, bones, our circulatory systems, and all of that. But that's all what I'll call hardware. Our real self, call it soul, spirit, mind, thoughts, whatever, we use those words pretty loosely. As I look out at the audience here, my frustration is I can't really see you. It's not because the lights are so bright. I can't see you because I, I can only see the temporary residences that you're in. The real you, as I say, call it soul, spirit, whatever, that's vocabulary, is software, not hardware. Now, here's the point. Let's talk a little bit about software. If I take a little diskette, you all have seen one of these little diskettes in our current computer age. If I take a blank cassette and put it on a postal scale, it will weigh about seven-tenths of an ounce. But if I load that blank cassette, I spent over, I've spent hundreds of dollars and load it with a million bytes of software and then put it on that po postal scale, what will it weigh? Seven-tenths of an ounce. In other words, software has no mass. A light switch weighs the same whether it's on or off. It carries one bit of information. But a, a computer registers the same thing. The, the, the information it doesn't have weight. It has no mass. In fact, I can even send it through the airwaves. The big thing today is wireless because these, th these messages do not require uh, uh, embodiment. They, uh, uh, they can exist on their own right. So software has no mass. Now, what does that mean? If, if, if time is a physical property and software has no mass, it has no time dimension. What that really means is the real you the real you is eternal. Whether you are saved or not, the, the issue is where are you going to spend it? If you're perfect, you can spend it in the presence of our Creator. If you're not, He has other plans. So we need to understand that. I want to talk also a little bit more about hyperspaces. That's just a fancy word mathematicians use for spaces of more than three dimensions. And uh, most of us have been brought up in school with what we call Euclidean geometry. But one of the most important lectures in mathematics was given on June 10th of 1854 when George Riemann invented a thing called metric tensors. It took 60 years for, until Einstein could use that mathematics to develop his four-dimensional space-time uh, uh, that underlies the uh, theory of relativity. He, Einstein went to his death frustrated because he couldn't resolve some other issues, which if he'd gone to one, another level up, they would have yielded, and Kaluza and Klein did that in 1953 by using more than four dimensions and reconciled light and supergravity in the field of physics. And in 1963, Yang and Mills, another duo, um, uh, resolved electromagnetic and both the nuclear, both the weak and strong nuclear forces by recognizing the additional dimensions. And since about 1984 onwards, people in this that, that deal in these things are now exploring the uh, the, uh, the the apparent. Uh, reality of superstrings that we now live, we begin to understand we live in 10 dimensions. And uh, I always find that rather interesting because there's an ancient Hebrew sage by the name of Nachmanides 
who wrote in the 12th century. Nachmanides, by simply studying the Hebrew text of Genesis chapter 1, concluded that the universe has 10 dimensions. He said, in his vocabulary, only four were knowable. The other six were, in his terms, not knowable. I find that rather interesting because we've spent millions of dollars on atomic accelerators that have caused particle physicists to conclude that we live in 10 dimensions. Four are directly measurable, the three spatial dimensions we know in time. Six are curled in less than 10 to the minus 33 centimeters and thus are inferable by only indirect means. And I think that's fascinating that the leading frontier of quantum physics is now caught up to where Nachmanides was 12, in the 12th century. But um, there are only two kinds of people that seem to be able to deal comfortably with hyperspaces, uh, spaces of more than three dimensions. And that's mathematicians with special training and small children. If I was going to try to communicate to you uh, aspects of four-dimensional or five-dimensional space, we'd both be having a tough time because outside our direct experience. But we can get some feeling for hyperspaces by going down a dimension. Let's, as three-dimensional people, let's examine two, a two-dimensional universe with two-dimensional people living in it. I want to introduce you to two friends of mine, Mr. and Mrs. Flat. I want you to be kind and compassionate here because they have a very serious handicap. They only live in two dimensions. And uh, so we're going, Mr. and Mrs. Flat live in a two-dimensional world. We are three-dimensional beings. I want you to notice some of the advantages that we have over Mr. and Mrs. Flat. First of all, we can, no matter where Mr. and Mrs. Flat are within their two-dimensional universe, we can be more intimate with both of them simultaneously than they can be with each other. I could put my finger, in theory, one millionth of an inch away from Mr. Flat and one millionth of an inch from Mrs. Flat, no matter where they are, I can have intimacy with both, independent of their spatial relationships, because I enjoy that extra dimension. Furthermore, if I should thrust my finger through their two-dimensional universe, the only thing that they would be sensitive to, they would see what? Not my finger. They would see a ring. They would see a circle. They would see a two-dimensional representation of this three-dimensional person that's intruded into the universe. If a sphere tumbles through the universe, they would see it as a point that would expand to a, sphere, to a circle and then shrink to a point as it disappears. So we begin to realize that the, the, the communication of a three-dimensional object to the two-dimensional people has some challenges. How would we go about that? How would you communicate a three-dimensional object to these two-dimensional people? By a two-dimensional projection is one suggestion. So we could try to project, say, a three-dimensional cube to get it into two dimensions to help them understand it. That would be probably less than satisfactory. How would we see a three-dimensional representation of a four-dimensional hypercube? There are such things, and you can go on the Internet and see them and play with them, but the more you play with them, the more you realize there's no way you'll understand them from a three-dimensional three vantage point without special tools. It's not very useful. Another way you might unravel a three-dimensional object into two dimensions to communicate to Mr. and Mrs. Flat would be to unravel it. We take our three-dimensional cube and flatten it, and that would be one way. But again, it wouldn't be too uh, useful. That's actually been done with a four-dimensional cube. A four-dimensional cube that's unraveled into three dimensions is called a, a um, tesseract or a Hinton cube. There's only one place I've ever encountered it as being useful, and it came in, I found it in a very surprising place. Salvador Dali uses a hypercube uh, to, um, uh, in his uh, famous painting, Corpus Christi. And uh, so uh, I was actually astounded to discover that Salvador Dali was that sophisticated mathematically to really understand the implications of a four-dimensional cube in a three-dimensional space. But uh, we'll move on here. Oh, before we do, Ephesians. I have to call your attention to Paul's writing in Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 17 through 19 Paul says that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith that ye, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height, and to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. A familiar passage, but I want to notice something. I want you to notice something. How many dimensions is Paul talking about? With all saints, what is the breadth and length and depth and height? In the Greek, one of those terms is the term for time, by the way. We've got four dimensions here, four dimensions in the text. I think that's fascinating. I'm not necessarily insisting that was Paul's intention, but I'm fascinated that the Holy Spirit in guiding him kept him physically 
on his toes. And uh, we find examples of that all through the Scripture in some ways that will surprise you. Jesus goes on to give us some further instruction about understanding the text in Matthew. When I first, I should mention something. When I first um, visited Israel, I remember a rabbi pointing out to me, he says, we, we really won't understand the text until the Messiah comes. But when the Messiah comes, he will interpret the passages. In fact, he'll interpret the very words, the very letters. In fact, he'll even interpret the spaces between the letters. And when I first heard that, I dismissed that as a colorful exaggeration. Until I read, once again, Matthew 5, verse 17 and 18, where Jesus himself says, Think not that I come to destroy the Torah or the law or the prophets. I come not to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one yacht or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. A yacht or a tittle. See, a yacht is uh, one of the 22 Hebrew letters that you and I would mistake for an apostrophe. It looks like a little blemish on the paper, just a little mark. A tittle is the little decorative hook on some of the letters. This is a Hebraic way of saying, as we might say, not the crossing of the T or the dotting of an I. This is a call by the Lord himself to take the text seriously. Not one yard or one tittle shall pass from the law. I take this as a call to taking the text literally. And uh, now that leads to another area that I want to just touch on. Are there hidden messages in the Bible? Well, the Bible says there are. In Proverbs 25, 2, it says, It is the glory of God to conceal a thing, and it's the duty or honor of kings to search out a matter. And I, in fact, uh, Rabbi Cordovero in the 16th century records that the secrets of the Torah, that's the Hebrew term for the five books of Moses, are revealed in the skipping of letters. There are lots of hidden messages in the Scriptures, but we're going to just focus on one called the equidistant letter sequence. What on earth is an equidistant letter sequence? Well, let me give you a contrived example here to get the idea across. Rips is one of the scientists in this area, by the way. But anyway, Rips explained that each code is a case of adding every fourth letter to form a word. Now, in this particular contrived example, if you take every fourth letter, an R, an E, an A, a D, a T, H, E, C, O, D, E, it spells a message itself. It says, read the code. Now, in this case, it's just a simple contrivance. But to get, a, get across the idea that you can have a message embedded in another message that is hidden, it has to be found by knowing what spacing to use and so forth. Now, with a computer, that's easily, you can try all spacing to see if there's a message there to see if something's going, and that's exactly what they've done. I want to share with you a discovery, or I should say a rediscovery, by Rabbi Weismandel, who was between... World War I and World War II, he made some discoveries in his study of the Hebrew text, which is a rediscovery of things that the ancient rabbis knew long before. He, was, he noticed some footnotes and some ancient documents he looked at, chased them down, and discovered something interesting. This is the book of Genesis, the opening passages of the Bible. Now, realize that the Hebrew goes from right to left. We would look at it as going backwards. You should understand that all languages flow towards Jerusalem. Countries that are west of Jerusalem go from left to right. Uh, Greek, uh, English, German, Russian, whatever. Uh, countries that are east of Jerusalem go from right to left. Hebrew, Arabic, Sanskrit, and others. But the main point is, uh, I don't know what you do with that piece of information, I just throw out because I think it's colorful. But the word for Torah, the Torah, the law, is in Hebrew it's four letters. One letter, it's, equi it's equivalent to our T-O-R-H. If you go to the first tau, which is like their T, and then count 49 letters, you come to a vav, which operates sort of like an O, and then you count 49 letters, and you, again, you get a resh, and then you count 49 letters, again, and you get a he. And a, 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 that's a, a tau, vav, resh, and he, which is equivalent to our spelling it T-O-R-H, that, that English transliteration of that would be Torah. And again, the Hebrew goes from right to left, the English goes from left to right. Now you say, gee, that's curious, uh, 49 letter intervals, it's, a, it's curious, and you don't make much of that, it's just a, a, many people argue, well, that's just an accident of statistics, it could have happened uh, any of a number of ways. Okay, you go to Exodus, and you discover the same thing happens, you go to the first how, and then you count 49 letters, you get a vav, count 49 letters, you get a resh, 
Then you get 49 letters and you get a hey. And again, it spells Torah. And you say, well, that's really a little more than coincidence because it obviously seems to be designed. It happens again in Exodus. The chances of those happening by chance start to become astronomically ridiculous. You go to Leviticus and you're sort of relieved when it doesn't happen at all. But you go to Numbers, something even stranger happens. You go, you find a he, a resh, a vav, and a pe. You find Torah spelled backwards. <laughs> I don't know how they discovered this. That sounds like they had time on their hands. But the point is, again, we have 49-letter intervals spelling out Torah, but backwards this time. And you go to the next book, Deuteronomy, you have essentially the same thing again occur with 49-letter intervals. Well, so you stand back from all of this and say, that's kind of strange. Forward and forward, and then Leviticus. Says, Let's take a look at this Leviticus a little more closely. And we notice not 49, which is 7 squared, but 7 letters. We find a, a, intervals of 7. We have a yot, a he, a vav, and a he. And the yot, he, vav, he is the unpronounceable name of God in the Jewish community. And now you stand back from this whole design. You've got Genesis and Exodus and going forward and Numbers and Deuteronomy going backwards. And you discover that the Torah always points to Yahweh or Yehovah or Yad uh, uh, Yad He uh, Vav He is the way some rabbis would deal with that. Um, interesting. Now, the question is, is this all happened by accident? Hardly. Is this evidence of design? Yes. What does it prove? I'm not sure. But there's so many of these things that are so profound that increasingly they come to be regarded as authentication. You try to dra draft some text with these kinds of properties, you'll discover it's getting, get, it's not near impossible. It's much more difficult than it looks to contrive these things. Let me shift to another, since we're talking about information sciences in effect here, I want to uh, acquaint you with another parallel that's rather provocative. There is a thing called holography. It's a form of lensless photography. If we take a, a three-dimensional image and arrange a photographic plate in such a way that a laser illuminates that plate, and that same laser illuminates the three-dimensional object, so that what the plate re records, there's no lenses here in the sense that it's not like a camera here, that, that plate will record the interference between these, the direct light and the reflected light. And what gets on the plate is... Something that when you develop the, the film looks like a darkroom mistake. It's a cloudy, indistinct, uh, looks like something you throw in a wastebasket. It looks like a mistake. And uh, yet, if you illuminate that developed plate by the laser that created it in the first place, you get a three-dimensional window into the space that was in front of it. And, uh, it's, we, and uh, we, uh, we call that sp the image on there a Fourier transform. It happens to be mathematically for you transform of the image. It has some very peculiar properties I think, you'd be, I think you might be interested in. If we take that plate, it's as if, if we have a, some objects out there, no matter how you look through that window, it's as if you're looking into that three-dimensional space. Let me give you an example. Let's, I have a tie on. Let's assume it's a tie with a distinct design of some kind. If I held my Bible up and you took a photograph of me, you couldn't tell what kind of a tie I'm wearing. If you took a holograph of me, you could move your eye and look around my Bible and see my tie. In other words, you've captured in the hologram a three-dimensional space, not just a two-dimensional representation of a three-dimensional space. That's what makes the hologram rather provocative for many reasons, but it's a Fourier transform. First of all, it requires proper illumination. It's useless in natural light. It has no form nor comeliness that you, you would desire it. The information that it contains is spread over the entire surface. It's not like a photograph where I could cut a pick part of that photograph out. I could, if I had a photograph of three people, I could cut one of the people out and give you two of them. If it was a hologram, you could look around the hole and see all three. See, the information, all the information is spread over the entire surface. There's no loss from dropouts. So in other words, there's, if you cut it, or if I cut two holograms and give you both of them, you both have a complete copy. It may not be as sharp as the earlier one. So it's resilient to specific interference. A hologram, is, it's as if it anticipates hostile jamming. Now, what's interesting, the Bible is like a hologram. It has some Fourier transform properties. It is transcendent of parallax and some other things. Uh, have, you ever, see, have you ever noticed in the Bible that there's no chapter on baptism? There's no chapter on salvation? Every truth of God is spread through the whole book. And that has a property that if you're, 
a communications engineer, de engineer designing a communication system in anticipation of hostile jamming, one of the things you do is spread your message over the entire spectrum. That is exactly the way the Bible is designed. There's some number of uh, interesting parallels between the properties of light and the attributes of God. Light ha the, the, uh, call the light we're talking about is laser light. It has no parallax, and it's as if it's located at infinity. Its velocity is constant, which is suggestive of a constant source of power. The photons lack lo lo uh, locality. All photons are immediately connected with all other photons in the universe. That sounds bizarre, but they've just recently discovered that, and it's, it's, uh, it's astonishing. And, of course, light is, it, is fundamentally the primary means of re revealing other things. And those, those are mathematically equivalent to the primary attributes of God, as if he's infinite, infinite power, omnipresent, and omniscient. So you can play with that a little bit. But it's interesting that these things are intentional. We find even in James, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights with whom is no variableness nor shadow of turning. That word variableness in the Greek is parallaxis, which is the term from which we get parallax, or implying the very collimation that the lasers have. So just as a, a hologram needs to be illuminated with the light that created it, it's useless in natural light. Uh, the information is spread over the entire bandwidth. There's no loss from dropouts. It's resilient to specific interference. That's also true of the Bible. There, in, in natural light, it looks like a collection of myths and folklore. When it's illuminated by the Holy Spirit, it gives you an image, the image of the one that we have to do, Jesus Christ. And uh, incidentally, if you illuminate the hologram with a laser of a different frequency, you get a false image. And if you illuminate this with the wrong light, you'll get a false image there too. The information spread over the entire Bible. It's designed that way, and as if it anticipates hostile jamming. That's exactly what Isaiah says in Isaiah 28. By the word of the Lord was unto them precept upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little, there a little, and so forth. It's deliberately spread. And uh, so, well, I've just touched on some of these things. You may find that interesting. It's not critical, but I thought it's provocative to those of you that have a, a interest in those things. We've talked a little bit about the nature of reality, the nature of time. We put a little insert there about the nature of software. We'll be talking more about that later. Um, we talked a little bit about hyperspaces because that's what we're going to find ourselves dealing with as we get into the Scripture. We talked a little bit about the fact there are some hidden codes. I will show you some astonishing ones as we go through, not to get into the details, but to give you a respect for the total package. The hidden codes are not to establish doctrine. They're simply there, as, among other things, for, as a means of authentication. And, of course, I talked a little bit about the holographic model. But now let's talk about an overview of where we're headed. The Old Testament, of course, is the story basically of a nation to set the stage for the New Testament, which is the story of a person, the person of Jesus Christ. And the Old Testament, I want you to understand something very important that most people don't understand. The Old Testament is incomplete. The Old Testament is full of unexplained ceremonies, sacrificial rituals that in and of themselves would seem to make no sense at all. It is full of unachieved purposes the covenants and so forth, many of which are yet to be fulfilled. The whole challenge in the Middle East today is the world's attempt to disavow the Abrahamic covenant. We'll talk about that when we get there. The Old Testament is full of unappeased longings. The poetical books are full of these. It's just an example. And, of course, it's also, perhaps of paramount importance, it is full of unfulfilled prophecies. And those are... We're going to be looking at those in some detail. These are all explained for you in John chapter 5, verse 39, where Jesus himself challenges you. He says, search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life. They are they which testify of me. And one of the secrets we're going to share with you is what do you do with the trial? How many of you have read the Bible and found something that made no sense, found something that seemed to contradict itself, something that just was not understandable. How many of you have done that? Anyone that doesn't have their hand raised up has not been <laughs> studying their Bible seriously. The next time you find something in the Scripture that you don't understand, I want you to rejoice because you have an opportunity to conduct a laboratory experiment in the supernatural. I want you to get a journal. Go get a journal. Your girls know what I'm talking about. The men have no idea. You go to a stationery store, you can buy bound books that are blank. And it's called a journal. And what I want you to do is get one and vow that no one will ever see it but yourself. And I say that so you'll be honest with yourself. No one's ever going to see this thing. It's your own private treasure. It will be when you're finished here. 
The next time you come across a passage that you don't understand, enter it in your journal. Put the date down, put the reference down, and try to describe in your own words, in ink, not in pencil, why it's puzzling, why it doesn't seem to make sense to you. Once you've done that, I want you to go to prayer. Go before your Father and remind Him that He promised that the Holy Spirit would teach you all things, not most things, all things. Lay claim on that promise. and Say, here's a passage in your word, Father, I, I don't understand. And I commit it to you to illuminate, illuminate my uh, confusion. And, and commit it in the Lord Jesus Christ in your own way. Now, it won't happen necessarily in the next 10 seconds, but I tell you what will happen. Something will cross your path that will make that clear. It might be a sermon you hear that Sunday. It might be something you happen to read. It might be a conversation you overhear in a restaurant. Uh, it might be something you hear on a radio broadcast while randomly tuning. I have no idea what will happen. But what will happen is something will come across your path that will make that passage that confused you clear. I want you to go back to your journal, enter the date, document what it means, and you say, Chuck, that sounds exciting, but uh, why all the paperwork? I'll tell you why. Because the days will come when you'll traverse the valley of doubts. There'll be times when you'll just go through a valley of despair. I want you to be able to pick up that journal and recount the footprints of the Holy Spirit as He taught you the Scripture. Not Chuck Missler or whoever some, your favorite Bible teacher might be, uh, but the Holy Spirit. And, and that will become a treasure that will be unique to you that, that, that won't make sense to anybody else, but it'll be very important to you. Every time you find a passage in the Scripture that you don't understand, I will predict that it will unravel to you. And when it does, it'll always involve some aspect of the person of Jesus Christ. His role, his mission, his accomplishments, his destiny, uh, some aspect. If you have a, a, a troubling area, put Christ right in the middle of it and watch what happens. And we'll show you examples of that as we go through this study. We're going to undertake a panorama of all history. And uh, we're going to start from the creation, the fall of man, through the flood to Abraham, um, all the way to the Exodus. That's the book of Genesis. That's a major portion of history that Genesis spans. Genesis ends with the book of Exodus. And after Exodus, we get, obviously, from there, we'll get into the, the monarchy, obviously, the life of David, up to the exile, when, when uh, the uh, house of Israel is captive in, 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 uh, to Babylon. The rest of the Old Testament will take you from the Exodus to the exile. And uh, there is a 400-year period between the end of the Old Testament and the beginning of the New Testament. Some people call it the silent years. That's unfortunate because... Those years are detailed for you in the Bible. They're in Daniel chapter 11 in advance. Many people don't realize that. Then, of course, we have the New Testament. The Old Testament spanned virtually almost 2,000 years. The New Testament spanned one lifetime. And many of the documents are contemporaneous. That we have. They're, they're scraps we even have that were contemporaneous. And obviously, the nation of Israel, after the crucifixion of Christ, has experienced the diaspora. But the Bible talks about, and we're watching the restoration, the beginning of the restoration of Israel. And people say, why are we studying the Bible now? Let me give you a big reason. I'm going to put something on the screen that I hope you will doubt. I want you to challenge this preposterous statement I'm going to put, I'm going to put on the screen. We believe that we are being plunged into a period of time about which the Bible says more than it does about any other period of time in history, including the time that Jesus walked the shores of Galilee or climbed the mountains of Judea. Now, that's a preposterous statement. But we believe it. We believe that you and I are being propelled into a period of time about which the Bible says more than it does even about the gospel period. Now, I hope you don't accept that. I'm counting on you to challenge that. To challenge that, you've got to do two things. You've got to find out what the Bible says, not what Chuck Missler says or whoever. Find out what the Bible says. The second thing you've got to do is find out what's going on. And I'm going to suggest the more you know about what's going on in Israel, in Europe, in China, in technology, in, you name it, the more you know about what's going on on our strategic horizon, the more you'll see it dovetail with the classic biblical scenario that was written thousands of years ago. Well, let's take a look at where we're headed. Um, the Old Testament, of course, consists of the Torah. Some people would call it under the Greek, the Pentateuch. The, the Jews would call it the Torah. The five books of Moses, the first five, most venerated part of the Old Testament to the Jewish community. 
It's followed by 12 historical books, which really chronicle the history of Israel. Then the literature of of Israel, the poetical books, the Psalms, the Proverbs, and others, five of those. Then we have 17 books called the Prophets, writings that were inspired by God that talk about the future and and, uh, God's plan in overview. It happens that five of those are large ones. That's why they're called major uh, prophets. Twelve of them are called minor prophets. But that's misleading. That's a librarian's designation. It has nothing to do with content. Some of those priceless little gems are when the so-called minor prophets. But in any case, we have 17 books, uh, prophets, which add up to a total of 39 books making up the Old Testament. And of course, uh, the Torah is where we're starting. The book of Genesis literally means the book of beginnings. Then the book of Exodus, which deals with the birth of the nation Israel. That's where it begins as a nation. The law of that nation is codified in a book called Leviticus. They wander in the wilderness for virtually 40 years, called the wilderness wanderings, before they enter the land. And uh, Deuteronomy is the last three sermons by Moses in which he reviews the laws and gives them guidance because he passes the baton to Joshua as they enter the land. So that closes the Torah. And the book of Joshua, of course, follows because Joshua is the successor and handles the the, uh, conquest of the land of Canaan. And, of course, in the next session, we will undertake a beginning of the book of Genesis. We're going to devote a substantial portion of time to Genesis and also to Revelation, both ends, because everything starts, everything in the Bible that has a beginning begins in Genesis and has its climax in Revelation. There, the book ends to the whole thing. And uh, so, the book of Genesis, of course, covers all the way to, up to the Exodus. But we'll be focusing next time on the creation and the predicament of mankind and how that all started. And uh, we'll actually take, in the, in the next hour, we'll take the, we'll take the first three chapters, the creation itself and the fall of man. And... Uh, then we'll finish what they call prehistory. We often take, uh, regard the first 11 chapters of Genesis as sort of prehistory, and um, as it's called by some scholars, and um, the flood and the Tower of Babel and all that. And then we'll, uh, we'll spend an hour on the patriarchs, the rest of the book of Genesis, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph, and why they are important to every one of us today. This is not just a question of Jewish history. It's a question of really understanding what God is doing and how he's doing it. And so uh, we just hope you really enjoy this adventure. I predict that it'll be the most challenging thing that you've ever undertaken and the most rewarding, most exciting thing you've ever done. So go at it prayerfully, and we'll see you next time.